Welcome to Uncut. I'm Steve Adubato. We're honored to be joined by our good friend. He's been with us many times in the studio. Hopefully we'll be back there soon. We're uh, joined by Ryan Haygood, President and CEO of New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. How you doing, my friend? Good to see you, Steve. It's good, it's good to see you. I've missed you. Missed you, too. You and I were uh, texting each other offline yeah. early on after the horrific um, incident involving George Floyd, um, what appeared to be a murder on camera that we all saw. And I remember saying to you when you said back, we have work, we have more work than ever to do. What is that work specifically beyond the protest? Yeah. Peaceful, hopefully. Beyond the protest, what exactly do we need to do? This is part of a series we're doing also called Confronting Racism. Mm -hmm. To confront racism, particularly as it relates to police and men and women who are black and brown, what do we need to do? Yeah, so Steve, again, thank you for you know, pushing the envelope on these conversations at such critical moments in time. And so I think, you know, to the question of what we do, I think the first thing we do is we lean into the title of your segment, we confront racism. And so, you know, May was a particularly difficult moment for, for this country, right? It was in May that we saw Ahmaud Arbery murdered in Georgia when he went for a jog. We saw Breonna Taylor who was killed while sleeping when the police executed a search warrant on the wrong home. We saw, to your point, George Floyd, who, who was killed who, when an officer leaned on his neck for more than you know, eight minutes and 46 seconds. We saw Rayshard Brooks this past- Atlanta. Killed in Atlanta. Here in New Jersey, Maurice Gordon was killed in the uh, New Jersey uh, uh, Garden State Parkway, an unarmed black man by a state trooper. And so- What about the incident in the Central Park? Central Park with a gentleman okay. who was bird watching. Christian Cooper, who was bird watching, and Amy Cooper uh, called the police on him. And, and she called the police on him in a way that invoked this really historical, irrational fear of a dangerous black man. And so all of these things have sort of come, to, to come together in a moment that has caused, Steve, people in 2,000 cities across New Jersey to take to the streets and protest, including your son who led a protest at his high school. So I think the thing we ought to do now is to confront racism. And what that means meaningfully, I think, is that we resist uh, return to normal, right? So there are folks particularly in the throes of the coronavirus pandemic, who long for us to get back to some semblance of normal. And I really wanna to suggest to your listeners and to your partners and our partners that we reject the idea of a return to normal because normal uh, was unacceptable for us. It was in normal, normal May. There were many months and years before May. We had a conversation, Steve, you and I, last year about how you begin to really repair the harm that has flowed from structural racism. So part of what I think a new normal requires is that we have hard conversations we haven't been willing to have in the past so that we can do things we haven't been willing to do, so that we can build systems that we haven't built before, so that we're not continuing to have conversations about police-involved killings of unarmed Black people. You know, I will say to you quickly that I was in high school when on March 3rd, 1991, Rodney King was beaten more than 55 times about the head, shoulders, back. He was unarmed. He was beaten senseless. And that was captured on camcorder. By the Los Angeles police. By the Los Angeles police. There were no convictions. Initially, it required federal civil rights charges to be brought up against two police officers who were convicted on that basis. But we're now almost 30 years removed, and Steve, we're still having the same kinds of conversations about why harm has to stop. And I think part of the reason is because we haven't had conversations about the root causes of what we're seeing. And that's part of what a new normal requires. You know, this is often referred to, you know, you also did another thing with us. You got me thinking about this. Um, you remember the forum that we did on police minority relations? Um, I hosted it with my great colleague uh, at NJTV, Michael Hill, a terrific journalist and anchor reporter. We had that conversation there as well. It was like two and a half years ago, I think. It was. But people keep saying, a lot of people say, this is a moment or the moment. Mm -hmm. So I know that we've had these conversations in the past. I know others have as well. But do you feel, Ryan Haygood, that there's something about this moment that gives us an opportunity to make real, genuine, impactful change? 
I do. I mean, I think this is probably probably the moment of this generation, right? You just don't see young people in particular taken to the streets and protests in the way that we have over the last month. These are really sort of once in a lifetime moments. And the thing about moments is that if you're not careful, you'll miss them. And so I think for us, we cannot afford to miss this particular moment. And let's talk, part of what this moment is about is about reimagining what public safety looks like. It's about reimagining alternatives to policing. It's about acknowledging that the way we've done policing doesn't keep us secure. In fact, it's very harmful as we're seeing it play out across America on TV where unarmed black folks are being murdered by police officers. So part of this conversation should require us to think more broadly, more ambitiously, more boldly about how do you build healthy communities? Part of that, you know, Steve, you and I have talked about New Jersey having some of the worst racial disparities in America. New Jersey is also a state that makes very deep investments incarcerating black and brown people. So young people in New Jersey are um, incarcerated, black young people are incarcerated at a rate of 21 times to one. So a black child is 21 times likely to be in prison than a white child. And New Jersey spends $300,000 to incarcerate each kid. So part of the conversation has to be about how do you make those kinds of investments in kids and their communities, not in incarcerating kids. That's part of what it means to reimagine public safety, empowering communities, alternatives to policing in this moment. Go, go back to the policing issue. Do you believe, Ryan, that there, there are two different things? Some have been calling for defunding the police. And if that means taking some dollars from the police department and putting it into recreation programs, programs about mental health that help young people, not others. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's one thing. Defunding the police with the purpose of doing away with the police, as I saw recently in a report, I believe in 60 Minutes out in Seattle, where there's a block, a few blocks, I'm not sure what the zone is called, but police are not allowed there. There are no police and people are, quote, policing themselves. I, there's a question here, trust me. Mm -hmm. What do you, do you actually believe in doing away with the police? So I think, you know, we ought to center, to your question, Steve, we ought to center communities and what they think they need in the community. And so I do think that we invest way too much money in supporting the police. You know, the country spends about $115 billion to support law enforcement infrastructure, law enforcement strategies. There are some cities that dedicate up to half of their budget in law enforcement. And so I think part of what you see around racial disparities, around challenges in communities, is that we spend way too much money in supporting police infrastructure. So I think what I propose is that we begin to think about how you make investments in other institutions that don't require a police response. I think very often in this country, in New Jersey, even in Newark, or where I live, we dispatch police officers to respond to things that really don't require a police response. So to your point, Steve, I think in what you've seen the mayor of Newark do, Raz Baraka do, is stand up in the Newark uh, the street team. Uh, they are, you're actually on the same program. The, leaders of the, the leader of the Newark street team is on this other half of this program. Akila Sherrills is on that. They, they're somewhat policing themselves. But before you go any further, I want to be clear that Mayor Baraka told us recently in an interview that he thought doing away with defunding the police is a somewhat, quote, bourgeois liberal idea. You don't seem to believe that. No, I mean, I, I think that the mayor would agree that we invest way too much money in policing. But what but, does it mean uh, to defund them to the point where there are fewer and fewer mm -hmm. police officers and you potentially have situations where people do need the police and then there's not enough police officers to respond, hopefully in the appropriate way? Absolutely. So, I mean, I think that the you know, part of that movement has been mis misunderstood in the sense that it is at least in part an aspiration, right? So you would imagine, you know, how do we create a community, a city, a state, a country where you don't need policing? And so that's obviously, I think, a phased approach. And the way that you get fewer police, right, is that you make deeper investments into community-based programming, into community-based services. You direct some of that money to things like schools, and libraries and parks, right? The things that build community so that you need police less often and you need fewer police. I don't think anybody's proposing that you do away with police overnight in cities like Newark. Or we have to be honest, we do have some serious acts of real violence in the city for which you need to dispatch police. I just wanna be clear about that point. But in my mind, 
alternatives to policing means that we think sort of in a visionary way, in a bold way, about how do we build communities by making deep investments in ways that empower them. Look, it's interesting, if you go to some other cities and you see a police officer, there's some concern, like, oh my gosh, why is there a police officer? But it, too often in cities like ours, when you don't see police, you worry, like, oh my gosh, where are the police, right? And I think even that requires us to recognize the ways in which we over-police ourselves because we activate police for all manner of things that police are ill-equipped to do, either because they're uh, poorly trained or overtaxed and can't really respond to those situations. So in my mind, we ought to be leading with a very visionary idea of what it means to build a healthy community and what kinds of investments you make so that you ultimately don't need police except in rare situations. Hmm. You know, Ryan Haygood, uh, you're joining us here for Uncut. And we honor, you're honor, you honor us by your presence. You, you teach us every time. You're also being so accommodating that we're going to do a follow-up segment with you that will be seen in another uh, program of ours. But confronting racism isn't just a title of a series that we're doing, a series of segments, interviews, programs. You've always said to me and you've said to others, this is a long fight mm -hmm. and all of us need to do our part. We're trying to do that. We're able to do that better when we have friends like you joining us, sharing your perspective on what needs to be done. So Ryan, thank you so much for joining us. We look forward to seeing you in person, in studio uh, very soon. Thanks, Ryan. Thanks for having me, Steve. I'm Steve Adubato.